Begin this message by saying this every person dreams and make plans for the future then they work hard to see those dreams and plans come true but to make the most of life we must include God's plan in our plan Got to be able to say, Lord, this is what I want to do with my life. Uh, but what do you want to do with my life? Lord, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a carpenter. I, I want to be a plumber. I want to be a preacher. I want to be a nurse. I want to be um, uh, a doctor or whatever the case may be. But Lord, what do you want? me to be. I spoke to a senator who went from being a youth pastor to a United States senator. The Lord said to him and his wife, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And they prayed over this constant Get ready, get ready. He didn't tell them what for. Just get ready, get ready, get ready. And they prayed and they prayed. And they these youth pastor and doing a super job in that church. And, and turns out when the Lord revealed to them what it was that he wanted them to do, they kept praying for a while. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to him and says, you're not praying now. Now you're stalling. I want to show you my plan. And I want you to do my plan. And against all odds, they spent their life savings. Against all odds, they had no chance of winning. Against all odds, they obeyed God and ran and won. Isn't that amazing? Wonder how many of us today have asked the Lord in terms of our careers, chosen fields of study. Am I in your will? How many dating people, when dating, ask the Lord, is this the person who's for me? Or do we tell the Lord, this is the person who's for me? This is the one, Lord. Lord, I know this is the one. Uh -huh, uh, this is the one. Glory to God. Five years later, when it's all gone down, the Lord will whisper and say, do you know you never asked me? It's amazing how God deals with us. Sometimes God deals with grown people like they're grown. So a grown person can come to the Lord and tell God a thing or two. I've had people do it with me. They tell me what they're going to do. And uh, more often than not, depending upon how I'm told, if I sense a spirit of rebellion or if I sense a made-up mind, I don't give my opinion. If I'm told, I say, okay, well, praise the Lord. Lady came to me one day and said, Pastor Wooden, the Lord told me to marry so and so. And I'm going to marry him. And there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm going to marry the man. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> this really happened. I said, No, ma'am. Now, had she asked me, I would have said, Well, ma'am, you might want to go back and check that because this guy's a cross dresser. This guy don't want women. You know, but she didn't ask. She told me there was nothing I could say about it, and she's going to do it, and the Lord told me to do it. So what do you have to say? After you tell me all that, I, what do I have to say? Nothing. Well, they got married. A year later, she called me, crying. Said, my husband has never touched me. My marriage was not consummated. It's been a year. She's, I mean, she's crying like she's at a funeral, bawling big time. And I feel like you could have told me something, but you didn't. I said, I could have. But you told me that there was nothing I could say. And there's nothing for me to say. 
God bless you. I hung up the phone. The point is, with all thy getting, get an understanding. The point is, get educated, learn all you can, then do this, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. See, we want to know God's plan. One of the most beautiful songs ever penned was written by, I don't know which one of the Winans wrote the song, but it's, it's, it's a question. And the question is, are we truly doing your will? We want to know whether or not we're in the will of the Lord. He alone knows what's best for us. He alone can fulfill his purpose for us. As you make plans and dreams and dream dreams, talk with God about them. You have a conversation with the Lord before you leave. I mean, you talk. You talk with God until that anxious, that, that itch to move goes away. Because sometimes Satan can give you an inflated sense of urgency. Only to cause you to miss God's plan for your life. It was commentary from the Life Application Bible. Let's take a look at this psalm, which is a psalm of praise and of thanksgiving, but it ends up on a personal note of reflection. This is a psalm of personal confidence in God that expresses the difference between being self-assured and assured. To be self-assured is not good. To be assured, to get your assurance from the Lord is a good thing. But we're not, we're not uh, encouraged to get our assurance from ourselves. When God assures you, God will insure you. Against whatever happens, he knows. But when we are walking in our own assurance, and there is no deception like self-deception. See, you, you hadn't been deceived until you've been deceived by yourself. Amen. We studied in the men's meeting the other day where the sluggard, won't even be convinced, he won't listen, if seven men who are successful, who are uh, randomly selected, all successful in their chosen field, if they tell the lazy the way you're going about it is wrong, that man still won't be moved by those successful people. There are some folk that you cannot instruct. Some of you, you know it all. When we start the sentence, you finish it. When we point you to a passage, you've already read it. When we try to give you life advice, you know it's only a confirmation because no one ever furthers you because at most all we can do is confirm things because you know it all. And yet there's nothing about your life that, that, uh, that says you know anything. Wisdom is justified by her children. And if your course of action is not producing anything, you might want to listen and take a different course of action that will help you in this life. Are you listening to me? This psalm deals with the difference between being self-assured and assured between pride and lowliness. David was exuberantly 
thankful for some great answer to prayer. In this expression of his gratitude, he has left us all a worthy example of how we should respond to God's wonderful deliverances. Now this psalm will, has, will have its complete fulfillment uh, under the gist of the Messiah when Jesus comes back in the millennial reign. But the text deals with David having been blessed of the Lord. The context has to do with the faithfulness of God in keeping his word. And the meaning seems to be that he has not only done what he said, but that he has gone even beyond that. Also, there also may be the thought that the, in the abundant fulfillment of the promise, God had surpassed all previous revelation of himself because he speaks of the word incarnate. When he says, thou hast magnified thy word above thy name, many believe the word there was a reference to Jesus Christ. That Christ is the superior revelation of God. God revealed himself as God Almighty. God revealed himself to Moses as Jehovah. God gave various revelations of himself. But the greatest revelation of the God of the Bible is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches this about Christ. When he walked there, the Bible says, In him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The greatest revelation of, of the God of the Bible is Jesus Christ himself. Now I want to say this to you before I get into this message and I won't be before you much longer. I said that we're going to honor God by allowing him to complete his purpose in our lives. And I know that there are those who may struggle a little with uh, the word allowing and dealing with the Lord because we, we, don't, we feel that we don't have to allow God to do anything. Because he's God and he, he does what he, what he wills. But the truth is, he is God and he does what he will, but he will not violate our free will. We all have a part to play in the purpose that God has for our lives being fulfilled. It requires a degree of participation on all of our parts. Are you with me? If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, you'll see where God gave mankind free will. There's no one in here today whom I can force to be saved. I wish that I could. If I could, I would. I wish I could take a hatchet, hit you over the head with it, Open your head up, put salvation in there, close your back up, heal your body, and you be and, and you are saved and on your way to heaven. But it doesn't work that way. If I could frighten you into getting saved, I would. If I could threaten you into getting saved, I would. Because the last thing I want for anybody, I don't even want, I don't even want the Klansman. I don't want Al, Al Qaeda. I don't want ISIS to go to hell. Hell lasts forever. Amen. Hell is real. Oh, preacher, you believe there's a, a literal hell? Yes. For the, just as I believe there's a literal heaven. Because the same book that tells me about heaven tells me about hell. We just don't preach much about hell. We, we don't talk about it. But there is a place. Amen. Someone was, uh, had a misunderstanding about hell. They thought that the devil would be tormenting people in hell. That's not true. He'll be tormented himself in hell. And he and everyone else who's going, I'm not going. Amen. Some people joke, well, when I get to hell, we're going to have a party. You can call it that. Because it will be noisy. 
but nobody, there'll be no laughter. There'll be no joy. Jesus likened hell uh, to the city dump. In biblical times, they did not have the sophisticated uh, systems that we have today in dealing with uh, uh, sewage and uh, um, um, water and trash and all that. Everything was dumped at a city dump. The dump was called Gehenna, where all of the trash and the refuse and everything else was burned. And the, the place was filled with maggots and, 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 and the stench of it uh, was, was horrible. And, and, and it, they had to burn it off all the time. And Jesus looked at that place and compared that place to hell. He says, there where the worms, the maggots never die. And where the fire is not quenched. That is what is awaiting those who will not hear the God of the Bible. And concerning getting saved, the Bible says this. This is to those who, will, who may tell the Lord today, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. There's a word for that. There's a word for telling the Lord when he tells at your heart that you're not ready. The word is blasphemy. To blaspheme, the way Jesus used the word, literally means to say to the Lord, I'm not ready, or to put God off. And the Bible says, he that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. See, it's the Holy Spirit that tugs at your heart that tells you to get saved. The Bible says if you tell the Holy Ghost, not now, I'm not ready, not at this time. The Bible says there's no forgiveness in this life, and then there'll be no forgiveness in the world to come. That means if you die having told God the Holy Ghost no, there will be no opportunity in the life to come to tell him yes. So you literally, you are literally not gambling merely with your future, uh, as in future in life here on this earth, but you're gambling with eternity when you tell the Holy Spirit no. But you have free will. It's up to you. Bible says this, and this was the crowning achievement when God made man. Uh, Genesis 2 and 15 says, And the Lord God took the man, and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That this is when, this is, this records God giving man free will. God gave man the option to say yes and to say no. The Lord could have programmed us like a computer to love him, but that's not true love. He could have programmed us to obey him, but that's not true obedience because you're programmed to do it. When it's true, it's when you have the option to not obey, and you obey. When, it's, when, when God knows that it's real, when the Lord says, you have the, the option to tell me no, but you exercise your wise right. You exercise wisdom by telling God yes. I love the Lord. Amen. But I have the free will to not love the Lord. As do you. It takes participation on our part. The prophet Isaiah said this. And I'm going to preach to you in just a minute. The Lord said in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now. Let us reason together. Saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be white as snow. They, they, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, if, it's up to you, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's our call. We can choose to say yes, or we can choose to say no. 
there are things that the Lord wants to do in our life. And you honor him by allowing him to. Let me tell you wives something. If you're blessed to have a husband who loves you enough to want to do something for you and who is in a position to do so, one of the greatest ways that you can insult him is by not allowing him to do what he set out to do. When I want to buy you some perfume or I want to buy you a car or I want to buy you a garment, I want to do something for you, and, um, and uh, you don't let him. And he's saved and he's worked hard and he's, 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 he's oh, all he wants to see is the, the gleam of appreciation and satisfaction uh, in your eye. And when he gets ready to make his move, we can't afford that. Oh, don't spend that much. How much did you pay for it? All that kind of stuff. And it dashes. You don't know. You may have meant well, but you're actually dishonored. The Lord wants to do some things in us. We're dishonoring God by telling the Lord no. Amen. Thank you for those three or four applause. I, I thought the brothers would get with me, but I guess some of you guys said, man, I don't know about anything. Because the last time, Pastor, I tried, you didn't receive it right. But I understand. <laughs> Now let's look at this. Let me preach before you accuse me of meddling. All right. So I'm talking about, and, and, and when you don't participate with the Lord, you know what he does? He moves to someone else who will. Because there's always someone who will. If you won't praise him, someone else will. If you won't tell the story, someone else will. If you, won't, if you won't do what he says, someone else will. There's always someone who will. David said to the Lord, I, in our text, will praise thee with my whole heart. Praise the Lord. Before the gods will I praise thee. Whole heart expresses devotion. And then when he says, I'm going to praise you before the gods, that is, David is saying, before all of the false, impotent gods who have no power, I am going to praise the Lord in front of them. I take joy in lifting my hands to the God of the Bible. And I lift my hands to him and him only. I do not lift my hands to the God of Islam. No, sir. I do not lift my hands to the God of Buddhism. No, no. Lift my hands to the God of the Bible. And uh, when, you, when you lift your hands to the Lord, you're saying to those other gods, you are impotent. You have no power. And saints, the Lord wants us to trust him like that. Oh, oh, what, what you think is going to happen? What you think is going to happen? What you think these Muslims are going to do? They're going to do anything to me that the Lord won't allow. Amen. Our God is real. He's the true and living God. And you, you can't let the enemy frighten you and have you where you are afraid to worship him and afraid to praise him and afraid to glorify him. As a matter of fact, one of the ways you honor the Lord is that when we're in the, in the presence of uh, others, uh, we speak up for him. Now, I saw in a commercial they had this uh, uh, fellowship uh, thing on the news. All the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians, all of them coming together and all this stuff, and they're laying aside their differences. And the media treats this, this stuff like it's good. Now, there are certain differences that I can't lay aside. See, because what if we come together and we got to pray? Now, that, that's going to be a problem right there. And uh, so, well, I'll tell you what we'll do so we won't offend anyone. 
We just omit prayer. Well, I believe that nothing happens without prayer. See, so, well, we're going to try to get this legis legislation passed, but uh, we, 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 since we got Jews, Christians, and Muslims here, we, we're, we're not going to pray, or we'll have a Jew, Christian, and Muslim prayer. Then I hear Elijah saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. See, the, the Bible, Elijah said, if Baal is God, serve him. But if Yahweh is God, serve him. Now, both of them can't be God. See, a lot of this stuff that they're bringing together uh, that you're seeing on the news, many of these agencies are wicked, and they're te they are teaching you to embrace idolatry. They're teaching you to embrace a polytheism and make you think that if, if one God won't, the other God will. No, 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 no. That's one God. <laughs> Amen. There's no room for there to be two gods. How many, how many beings can there be that is everywhere at all times, at all places, with all power, all knowing, all the time. Now, there's only room for one being like that. And that's the God of the Bible. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Serve the Lord. Amen. Don't let anyone cause you for the sake of getting along with somebody for, or for the sake of not offending someone. They, you, you back off of your testimony. Why would you do that? They're not backing off of theirs. Everyone else is getting louder and louder and they're telling the Christians to stand down. David said, no, I'm going to serve the Lord with my whole heart and in front of the gods will I praise thee. And I'm going to praise you for your loving kindness. Oh, you talk about a loaded word. That's a sermon right there. Loving kindness. The Hesed agreement. Loving kindness. The sure mercies of David. Loving kindness deal with God. That you can count on the Lord. You can count on his mercy to get you out. You can count on the Lord to come through for you. You can count on him. There is nothing like the loving kindness of the God of the Bible. For thy loving kindness and for thy truth. The truth of God. Up Rome, I'm going to always preach God's truth to you. Amen. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.